Um, this is a project that I started with um, some co-conspirators who are here today. I've got Judith Brent Hinkler, Cecily Marcus, uh, Linda Shapiro, and we're missing Nancy Mason Hauser. Also, um, kind of were my consult as we put together this series. And this first one is actually in partnership with Body Photography Project. And uh, fall 2014 Project Improv uh, programming that's in partnership with the Warburg Center's Steve Paxton uh, Festival that's coming up in November. Today is the history of <coughs> local contact improvisation. And, um, you know, when I when I first moved to the Twin Cities, there were some elements of the dance community that I noticed right away, and and the kind of the oral history that happens. A lot of I would hear stories. I'd meet somebody new and be like, "Oh, well, you know, that used to happen here." And oh, I used to take classes with so and so. And a lot of it still feels really fresh. And so having this time together to kind of collectively remember some of our history. Um, it reminded me of uh, growing up in Canada and in back the license plates say je me souviens and the French are very nostalgic so it makes sense that these license plates say I remember but it actually literally translates to I remind myself and so that's what I felt like today would be. It's like we remind ourselves of our so with that, we'll get started. Although my first speaker just ran to the other side of the room. So I'll just pause. Well, you can tell them what this is. Oh yeah. So in the background, um, some of the some of the research we were doing um, as a team, we were pulling out all kinds of images and videos from archives, and this is a documentary that was created around a project with danceability, and it was the last project before New Dance Performance Lab closed. And so Linda Shapiro will talk more about that, but just having the images in the background, but like a, a way to start looking forward by looking back. All right, all over here. Um, so, so awesome you're all here and really uh, also exciting for me that this is happening at the Coles. We've been doing, uh, I think since the beginning of September, classes and jams upstairs in the education studio, which have been fantastic if anyone's interested in actually coming and putting your body back into what is contact improvisation. There's been about 20 to 30 people there every Monday night uh, taking class with different teachers in the community and jamming. Um, so I'm very excited, thank you Michelle so much for the opportunity to kind of uh, reconnect with this community because I do feel like there's a history and there's been a very strong history of this work in the Twin Cities, um, but there's also a contemporary uh, reality and the, and the form has really, I think, uh, it has the tendency to appear and disappear like it has waves of popularity and function around it over time for different so it's just nice to be able to refresh and re-engage with, um, with what it has to offer. Um, I'm going to just read you a little short history that Lisa Nelson and Nancy Stark Smith uh, wrote uh, in 1979 about the sort of beginning moments of contact improvisation. Uh, Lisa is coming with Steve in November to perform together a piece they've developed together at the Walker. And Lisa and Nancy together have co-edited Contact Quarterly, which is this amazing publication. Um, there's some copies over here if you don't know about it and you want to have a little look at it. So here we go. I'll read a little bit. During a Grand Union residency at Oberlin College in January 1972, Steve Paxton made a work for 11 men in which they threw caught, flung, collided, and fell among one another continuously for 10 minutes. And then they stood for a few minutes. The dance was called Magnesium. That spring, while teaching at Bennington College, Steve met with two students, Leon Felder and Nita Little, who had been stimulated by a similar curiosity with the physical force 
forces that affect motion, experimenting with lifting, falling, exchanging weight with mutual support. And in June 1972, with funding from Change Incorporated, Steve gathered with about 15 of the best athletes that he could find to run a course, uh, to run in the course of a year or two of his teaching. Both men and women, and these were the people were going to explore together the principles and potential of communication first evident in magnesium. The first week they spent in rehearsal, and then the second week was in the context of a public showing at the Weber Gallery in New York City. They spent five hours a day in the gallery practicing together contact improvisation. The event was called Contact Improvisation, and uh, that included some the performers, Barbara Dilley, Mary Fulkerson, who was one of my teachers, Danny Letkoff, Nina Little, Bert Fidel, Nancy Stark-Smith, who's taught here, Nancy Toff, amongst others. Inspired by this event, they worked continuously, and uh, in 1973, Steve, Kurt, Nancy Stark-Smith, Nina Little, and Karen Radler came to the West Coast performing and leading workshops of contact improvisation under the name you come and we'll show you what we do. <laughs> the ambience of the work and performance continue to be informal. No music, special lighting or costume, audiences in the round, duets and trios interspersed with solo dancing. In June 1973, Steve brought a group to Europe for the first time to perform in Rome. In 1974, Nita, Kurt and Nancy were the first work were in the San Francisco Bay Area teaching the form to others and developing more dance mates and developing a context for the work's expansion. Joined by Steve Paxton in 75, they formed Reunion, the first formal contact improvisation company, meeting once a year to tour to the West Coast with performances and classes. The development, the, co the continuing dialogue concerning context development soon included hundreds of other individuals and groups. And Contact Quarterly, which was formerly called the Contact Newsletter, was initiated by Reunion edited and produced by Nancy Stark-Smith, to foster communication among the geographically dispersed teachers, performers, and practitioners of contact. So, then, just to say, because this is a very important thing about the form, the form was never copyrighted, it was never formalized as something that was owned by anybody. It's always been something that has been driven by interest, so this is something that Steve wrote and was actually said in 1983 at a contact symposium. What's at stake in the contact network actually is very little. You know nothing particular to gain that is immediately apparent by being part of this network. Nothing particular to lose if you decide to stop. And you can rejoin again without any kind of any commitment. To me that is refreshing. There is no commodity. It's almost like you're following your own mind. If you're slightly interested, very interested, or interested, or on up that scale, then it's easy to be in it. If you're not interested, very uninterested, or bored, or whatever, then you're not a part of it. And that's about the scale of it. It only survives through actual interest, and that's the energy that's maintaining it as a practice and as a form. Um, one other lovely thing too from Patrick Scully that Patrick just found um, from Keith Hennessy, um, which is also just indicative, I think, of the formation of contact, which kind of developed through the 60s, but really emerged as a form, in, or was identified by Steve in the early 70s, and then developed by this whole community of practitioners. Um, is that in 1980, there were 13 contact improv companies in the USA and Canada. In 1980, Reagan was elected and things changed. By 1982, there was not one CI company still in existence. So it just, it kind of it speaks to a need. It speaks to also what gets funded. It speaks to this idea of ownership. It speaks to the idea of practice and also the relevance even as contact as a social practice or a performance form. I think uh, layers to this work that are inspiring. Just to um, cite my own uh, relationship to the form very quickly and then I would like to kind of get out of 
out of the way. Uh, I uh, uh, was re I really came to dance through through contact improvisation, through improvisation, and through uh, dancing in nightclubs. Actually, oh, actually, I jazz ballet. But my I, I really had this kinesthetic drive that was not on. It was not a. It was not something that was. Um, you know, fitting into the model of, of, of dance trainings in the era that I was growing up. And I met Michelle in the Netherlands at the school for Center for New Dance Development in the early 90s. And, for example, met Kristen at the Context Improvisation 25th year anniversary. So there's always a champion of Ireland, Ohio. I met Otto also at a Context Improvisation and Mixed Ability event with Karen Nelson on Bachelor Island. So there's all these pieces of sort of dance history, I think, that don't just bring in, that are about the local community, but then there are also all these things that uh, build relationship geographically to our community, which is an international community. Um, contact thrives, not just in the States, it really thrives in certain parts of Europe, and in Argentina and Israel, where there's like multiple jams running the week. And I think in the Twin Cities, as here, there have been on and off periods of more contact um, action and less, but I think that's maybe enough history for now from the larger frame. Yeah, so thank you. Themselves before they speak right. because some of us aren't in the dance. Right. Okay. <laughs> and this is Patrick Scully. Yep. Sorry, my name is Michelle Steinwald. I get nervous, so I forget to say my name. <laughs> and Michelle works here, and I hope we'll all get a chance to know who's who here. Yes. So, my name is Patrick Scully, and in uh, 1975 on, I purposely did not make enough of these, so share these, because this is in the spirit of contact in the early days, where it's not an individual thing, it's a collective experience. In the summer of 1975, I hitchhiked to Washington, D.C. to take classes for a month at the um, what is it, American Dance Festival. Yeah, that summer, I was in Washington, D.C. at Wolf Trap Academy. And when the festival started, they had two artists that they introduced to all of the dancers who were there because they were going to be teaching a dance form that nobody knew anything about. And they wanted to sort of promo these two people to encourage people to be exposed to the form. And so that's when I first saw Steve Paxton and Nancy Stark Smith. And, um, and I took my first contact classes from the two of them. And it totally freaked me out. It was like, you just learned how to hear, and you arrived in the battle. <laughs> it was especially that level of physical contact with that many people that I didn't know was sensually and erotically like so overstimulating that like, my system just kind of shut down. It was like more than I could handle. It would be like somebody saying to you, get in the car and drive from St. Paul to Minneapolis at rush hour. That would be leisurely drive. You know, it was like to focus internally that much and have that much external stimulation was for me impossible. So, summer of 75. January 1976, Mary Cerny, member of Nancy Hauser's dance company at the time, comes back from a year sabbatical, I believe it was a year, in the Bay Area, where she had been taking classes with me a little in contact and improvisation. That's the flyer that I just passed around was the flyer for Nita's first contact improv classes in the Bay Area. Mary started teaching these classes here, and I took the classes in a setting at the Guild of Performing Arts that I was familiar with, with mostly other people that I also knew, and all of a sudden it wasn't battle anymore. It was as if somebody introduced me to my native language. It's like, this is the language that my body understands. And so Mary taught the winter series. She taught a spring quarter thing at the Guild. 
And then she left to go to England to be closer to Mary Fulkerson and do some work together with Mary. And um, left behind a bunch of eager students. Um, and some of us decided that we would just form what we called at the time the contact work group. Very kind of proletarian name and spirit <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and the work group was initially open to anybody that wanted to come. But after we had worked together a few times, we realized we didn't want to have to keep introducing people. And we wanted to be able to build on what we had already done. And so at some point, we became a closed group. And actually, a, it evolved to where we called ourselves Contact Works. And we were engaged really in teaching each other and teaching classes for the public. We were engaged in performing, and our performing in Contact Works was mostly local, but got as far from here as Cleveland, Ohio, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, um, but in addition to teaching and and performing, we also rehearsed together. We rehearsed together four hours a day, five days a week. Um, the teaching that we did was for adults. It was also in colleges when we did residencies various places, and it was also work that we did in public schools and elementary schools and high schools. Um, and with that, I'm going to start playing one of the first video clips that I have here. When was what? The Oakland event. Oakland, this? <clears throat> this would have been in 1974. <coughs> 74, 75, I'm not sure. There's, like most dance posters, there's no date on it. We performed, we rehearsed, but we also produced a lot of stuff. 
Thank God for Wendy Oliver. She recorded, she got a lot of the stuff that we did recorded and documented it and put it together and edited things. Um, but we produced a lot of jams as well and we produced a lot of other artists from the forum coming to the Twin Cities. Um, Mangrove came here a couple times. There was a, collaborative, a collective from Ann Arbor, Michigan called Mirage that we would do exchanges with. We would do all the legwork for them performing and teaching here. They would do all the legwork for us performing and teaching in Ann Arbor. Um, because sometimes those financial re relationships got tricky. Like Mangrove, when they would come to town, sometimes assumed that we had resources like we were the Walker or the University of Minnesota, but we were just this collective working together. And um, I remember one big unpleasant argument that we had about the contract that they had signed when they came to Minneapolis, so, with, which I had to say, you know, they said, well, when we're touring, we're either usually sponsored by a big institution or the local grassroots community, but when we come to Minneapolis, somehow we're somewhere in between. And I was like, no, we are the local grassroots community. We've just got our shit together. <laughs> so when you come and you see and you have really good turnouts for your shows and you have a lot of people in the classes, it's because of the work that we're doing here in the community and we need to be paid for some of that. So, um, we also sponsored them with the American Dance Guild, the University of Minnesota and Walker Art Center, the American Dance Guild's Art Sport Conference that happened in June of 1980. And that was mostly in buildings at the University of Minnesota. I remember walking into a gym, in Norris Gym at the U, one of the large gymnasiums, and there were a couple hundred people stretching and rolling around each other, doing contact, and it was, it was like the early days of contact for me of like too much stimulation. I made sure they opened another gym that had fewer people in it so that you could go and do contact and maybe have more than six square feet of space around you. Um, <coughs> but then there was a performance all of the different groups that came to town had a maximum of 15 minutes on stage in a performance series that was done in the proscenium stage uh, in Rare at the university. And we decided as the home group to claim the right to perform first. Because it was sort of like the Contact Olympics. It was more competitive than Contact had ever been because there were all these people from everywhere showing each other and everybody wanted to do well and be well represented and, and people were nervous and scared. And so I'll just play you a little clip of our performance. Now is an improvisational performance done during the American Dance Guild Conference in June of 1980 in Minneapolis. In this case, the score involves the use of alarm clocks. strictly contact improvisation. Art sport was more broad in its scope and more sort of embracing of any and all kinds of improvisation. We wanted to have a week that was just for contact improvisation. And it was really a time in which like the whole contact world was like really focused right here locally in Minnesota. So 
during that time, I, there's just a couple other things that I want to mention. We performed at a lot of places around town. We were invited by the Walker to curate a choreographer's evening. Um, we performed works uh, through young audiences. We had a children's show that we did in elementary schools all around the state. We performed at Worthington's uh, Community College, Bemidji State University, St. Mary's and St. Teresa's down in Monona. And we were really very engaged as a touring and performing and teaching company at the time. We also had a lot of quiet supporters behind the scenes, people like Nigel Redden, whose tastes and preferences for postmodern dance meant that he noticed what we were doing and gave us opportunities and sometimes letters of introduction to other people that made life a little bit easier and sort of smoothed the way and made connections for us. It was also where I first met Jeff Bartlett and began to work with him. Um, Jeff did a lot of our lighting. Uh, well, actually, almost all of our lighting. It was a rare show that we did that Jeff didn't light. Um, but by 1980, it was time for me to leave Contact Works after four years of being involved in it because I got to a place where I realized that I needed to find my voice <laughs> as a gay man in the work that I was doing. And as the only GLBT person in Contact Works, I, um, I didn't feel oppressed by that group, but I didn't feel like I was going to find the answers that I needed there. And uh, my travels took me, and my searching took me to work with Ruth Sapora, took me to work with Remy Charlotte, and the piece that I did with Lance Westergaard was no contact experience at all, but when Nancy Sark Smith saw that performed in 1984, exactly 30 years ago this weekend, she said, this is the first successful marriage of contact improvisation and classical ballet. <laughs> uh, I also, through Jim Tyler, who was one of the founding members of Mangrove, met Pooney Dodson, um, who later danced with Bill T. Jones, and uh, Pooney and I did a few collaborative pieces together. And then, ultimately, um, Chris Aiken eventually made his way to Minneapolis, and I saw Chris when he was auditioning for a... a I met Chris when he was auditioning for the Out There series. I believe it was in 1990, and he and I started working together very soon after that. And this is me performing with Chris at the New York Improv Festival in 1994.
us that the critic is explaining things to you so that you understand it in a way that's more complex than you understood your own work before you read what the critic had to say was one of the gifts of being able to be reviewed by someone with as much experience as Deborah Jowd had. Uh, How'd you do that in suits? <laughs> the, Sorry. After Unsafe, Unsuited, probably one of the major things, two other things that I'll mention just in terms of my ongoing work. In 2006, I helped to organize the 30-year reunion of contact works that mostly happened at Patrick's Cabaret, but part of which also happened at the Walker. And then I would say that my work with contact, even in the most recent work I did, uh, Leaves of Grass Uncut, working with a cast of 17 dancers, some of whom were experienced in contact, some of whom were not, but the knowledge and influence of contact improvisation is unmistakable, I think, in the nature of all of the dance work that I continue to do here. Um, so as, as Alice said, there's sort of an ebb and flow of how this web of contact improvisation gets created. There are times when some people are more active, some people are less active. But I would like to just articulate that it happens sometimes through classes, whether that's for adults or college students or people in schools, kindergarten through 12. It happens by the establishment of spaces. The spaces that Contact Works had were always spaces that jams happened in. Jams still frequently happen at Patrick's Cabaret on a sort of off and on again <laughs> schedule. Um, it, the ebb and flow and the web is built through individuals and organizations. Sometimes connections happen. Orlando, a show first produced by Illusion Theater in 1977. Um, Bonnie Morris of Illusion Theater took classes from Mangrove when they were in town and made a connection that allowed Illusion Theater to perform Mangrove in San Francisco in Mangrove space when they were there uh, in the late 70s. It happens sometimes through the way that policies are established. The influence of contact improvisation has made it such that nobody questions that an improviser should be eligible to apply for a dance grant for dance grants that are generally given to choreographers. And that wasn't always the case and isn't necessarily always the case other places. Um, but that's something that I think has been part of the culture here. Um, it, it also impacts the world of critics and there's a back and forth in that world. And um, I will say that locally, I was glad that before he passed, I was able to establish a connection with Mike Steele that I felt comfortable with because it was my experience that um, Mike, as articulate as he was in a, as a writer about dance, um, got confused sometimes when it came to improvisation. And I think part of his confusion was centered around the fact that I was very prominently engaged with that locally and I was an out gay man and he was a gay man on the other side of Stonewall and we actually had an opportunity to talk about that. Um, but it impacted what got written about and what didn't get written about. And so that interplay between what gets noticed and what doesn't, um, sometimes it's because of the aesthetic of the form, sometimes it's because of the identity of who's doing the form. Um, but that, that importing and exporting has always been something that Minneapolis hasn't been a major hub of, but Minneapolis has been a significant player in in the 30 year plus years that contact improvisation has existed as a form. And I'm just going to switch here. Um, I realize in talking about what I've talked about that there are lots of other things that I could have talked about. Um, but I, I've only got so much time and I also wanted to talk about the things that I was personally most involved in. But I'm just going to at random pick a clip here and uh, also by way of bringing up our next speaker. Uh, my work together with Chris Aiken also intensified my opportunities to dance together with Jane Shockley. And um, this is 1999 at Patrick's Cabaret, uh, an improvised trio that Chris and Jane and I um, perform. Thank you very much.
40 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to keep this playing? No, you can shut that off because I'll be very distracted by it. Um, so, as Patrick said, my name is Jane Shockley. And um, in preparing for um, today, I, I was racking my brain. Where did I first, what, what was my first introduction to contact? And I was an original member of Xenon Dance Company, so eight years of choreographers. I then danced with um, New Dance Ensemble, which was a company that Linda Shapiro directed, and a year of choreographers. And then um, we, she started New Dance Performance Lab, which was basically four years of choreographers. So this huge amount of people that I actually worked with. And I'm like, where, who was the first person that introduced me to contact? And then I walked in here today, and there's Rick Watson. And I said, Jane, hi. Um, yeah, you know, I think I taught you at UMD. And I went, oh my god, you're kidding me. Rick Watson taught a workshop at UMD where I was a student. I have no recollection of it at all because <laughs> it was college. Um, so again, these sort of, you know, these, these webs of people that um, kind of come into my life. And so then I, of course, went, oh my gosh. And then I went back to um, sort of the choreographers that I worked with. And I believe the first choreographer that actually introduced me to Contact and Conversation was Randy Warshaw, who danced with Trisha Brown. And he did a piece on Xenon. And I have some sort of odd recollection of doing some kind of partnering work with him in this piece. And then I was in preparation for this um, today. I was going through my journals. And like all of my journals, there's names and quotes and pictures and half everything. Um, and I see at the top of one page, BB, Scott, Ernie, People, and Krista. And then underneath that was contact, must pursue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my God, Where, you know, what was that? And I think that was my reflection of Bebe Miller's performance at the Ordway. She did a, um, a dance called Double Duets. Does anyone remember that, Bebe Miller? It was obviously <coughs> um, choreography that was inspired by contact improvisation, and it was double duets in absolute unison. And I went, oh my god, must do. However, I can't quite remember the timeline, if that was before or after. I was a student at Bates Dance Festival, and at the time, um, <laughs> um, it, was, it was in the era of Xenon slash jazz dance. And Danny Berchewski was the um, artistic direct, co artistic director of Xenon slash jazz dance. And he was teaching at Bates Dance Festival, and I was a student there. And he asked me if I would perform a duet with him in the faculty concert called Merry Go Round. And I was like, sure, why not? Um, so it's tech night. And I'm standing in the wings, waiting, you know, to do the piece. And this group of people is out there on stage. And they're rolling around and laughing. And, you know, just. And I know for sure it was Andrew Hollywood. And I'm not sure who the other three people were. And I'm going, oh my god, I think there's no music. They have no <laughs> idea what they're doing. <laughs> And then Andrew says, yeah, um, to, the, to the lighting designer, he's like, yeah, after, I don't know, about 12 minutes, you can take the lights out. And I went, <laughs> you're kidding me. That's actually possible to be on stage 
with you know like no music, no counts, no true beginning, no true end. And I again I just went, I've got to do this. And I think at that point I realized the term contact improvisation. That was sort of the first. I was like, what is that? Okay. So I came back to Minneapolis, and shortly thereafter, Chris Aiken moved to town. And Chris Aiken was from Boston, and he moved to town because his wife, Kathy Young, danced with Xena slash jazz dance. And he brought his um, collaborative partner, Olivier Besson, to do a workshop slash showing upstairs in Xenon's space, 4A. So I'm sitting there, and they, they, they thought that wasn't the round. They'd often perform in the round, which was also like, oh, mind-blowing to me who had come from dancing on a proscenium <laughs> stage. And I watched the performance, and then I turned around, and there was Patrick sitting behind me. And I kind of knew who he was, and I turned around and said, um, I, you know, I think I introduced myself, and I asked Patrick, do you teach contact improvisation? Because I'm really interested in studying it. And I can't quite remember what that answer was. I think you said, I'm not at this time, or something like that. So, Chris Aiken, the Aiken era, <laughs> as I call it, um, he really um, sort of became kind of the anchor of um, my intentional um, learning of contact improvisation. Um, and also, like Patrick, I had, in one of my journals, I had written down contact improvisation um, I feel like I am home. <clears throat> so it's like once I started doing that, it was, you know, that it was just, it was meant to be. And it felt very natural for me to just be in this room full of people rolling and very close contact. I actually was really kind of wanted more of that charge that was like, yes, bring it on. Because I had been, you know, sort of in this little don't touch me kind of world for a long time. So when I got into this room of people touching, I was like, yes, more, more. So um, Chris, Chris decided he wanted to form an improvisational group. Um, so we formed um, Body Logic. Chris Aiken, his uh, wife Kathy Young, Olivier Gasson, and myself. And basically, we taught workshops in here and out east in Florida. We performed. All of our performances were with music because Chris was really interested in improvisational um, movement and improvisational. Um, what's his name? Julie Hamilton. Julie, uh, Julie Hamilton. The, the, uh, the drummer. Peter? No. I can't remember. It's, his last name is Hamilton. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what's that? It is Peter, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Peter Hamilton. Um, so we did, you know, just basically open performances or open scores for as long as we can handle it. Jeff, again, was often the lighting designer, so it was improvised music, improvised lights, improvised movement. So it was really um, an all improvisational uh, experience. And um, so Chris, being from, from out of town, had all these connections everywhere else. So he brought in, I, I have all these names written down. Oh. In 1996, John Kalaki at the Walker decided to bring in improvised.
advisors from around the country, and he thought he would call it the Improvisational Summit. <laughs> Sounds fair. So, um, so who came in that summit was Nancy Stark Smith, Holly Motley, Jeff Bliss, Julie Carr, Ray Chung, Olivier Besson, Chris Aiken, myself, and John Jaspers. So, um, so it was a week-long um, teaching and then a final performance at the Walker. Um, and I was starstruck. Most of the performance goes like this against the wall. I come out, then I go back. <laughs> Plus, I was, just had my daughter, so it's a good excuse. Um, so there was that. And then there was the, the lab days, I call it, where um, I danced with Linda's uh, new dance performance lab. And basically it was a laboratory where choreographers could come in and work from anywhere from two weeks to a month, and they had to have they didn't have to have any product. So it was all process. And there was a few choreographers that um, I worked with that I think used contact improvisation to really develop the work. And one of them was Bill Young. Yeah. Um, and he's a choreographer in New, in New York. And yeah, I just remember standing in a group and he's like, okay, why don't you move through each other? Okay, why don't you add a little weight? Okay, why don't you jump and catch? And sort of building this, this score um, through that. And, um, and then, of course, the Dance Ability Project with Alito Alessi was, um, was probably, for me, personally, because um, it has kind of be profound um, experience to work with um, differently abled bodies. Um, and that was the first video we had on. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And this is where I actually kind of realized that anybody can do contact improvisation. Um, and it's also where I realized that my sort of prowess as a, as a dancer didn't matter at all anymore. Um, working with Bonnie Dunn, she was um, a dancer that came with Alito, she moved at this pace. However, when she started falling, <laughs> so to, to, um, to sort of be in that space with this body and also with Arlene, is that her name? The, the um, blind? woman. It was just incredible. It really was. And it kind of, you know, it brought to the forefront that what contact improvisation is all about is just being together and really listening to each other. And, um, and what can come from that. And, yeah, okay. I'll go on. Two. So Chris, still in the Aiken era, he brought in many people to teach workshops and also to perform with. Um, one of them being Peter Bingham, um, another of them being Andrew Harwood, uh, Kirsty Simpson, and he did a performance at the Southern with, I think it was Steve Paxton, Kirsty, Ray, yeah, Ray Chung, and uh, you know, this group of people. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And um, 
So I had the after party. <laughs> so excited because Steve Paxton was coming, and I'd get to like pick his brain. So we're in the we're in the kitchen, getting our food, eating, and I walk outside, and I have a I had a porch with a porch swing. There's Steve. <laughs> Sleeping <laughs> on my porch swing. <laughs> and I went, perfect! <laughs> Just the way it should be. So um, that was that was my Steve Paxton story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. And um, I did um, some teaching upstairs at Xenon, where I was first introduced to Kristen. Kristen came to my class right out of college. Imagine this, Kristen Van Loo in a black unitard. Her hair up in a bun. Was it shiny? Yes. Walks in. Yes. Yeah, it was. Walks in and stands in front of the class, you know, just like, and I said, roll down the spine. And she rolled down and she started stretching. <laughs> and I'm like, it's okay, you can relax. <laughs> and then I said, we're going to do some contact improvisation. And I had just talked to Kristen before, and she said that that was really the first moment that she put contact and improvisation together. So, um, yeah, she's loosened up a lot. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. And then um, I had the opportunity to go to Brighton Bush Jam, which is a week long jam that happens um, in Oregon. And it's this beautiful place with hot, with pools, hot, hot water pools, beautiful dance space. And um, I met Jess Curtis there, who is from California. And we, I produced a workshop for him upstairs in 6A, when 6A was still a studio. And um, he, he was really, um, also sort of a defining force for me to continue to do contact because I had met him after I had my daughter and I was you know feeling mm -hmm. and he came in and really had that athleticism that I really was, was craving. So he kind of uh, yeah brought me kind of back into the fold of And, oh, Ishmael Houston Jones, when you said that name, all of a sudden, I took a, a workshop with him at Minneapolis Community Technical College. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was an improvisation. I don't know if it was contact improvisation, but I remember walking around, and he said, let's walk around and say the colors that you see. And I still use that exercise. Yeah. As a way of just, you know, bringing you into the, uh, the moment. Um, and, yeah. And then, in the, We did a show together in Space Space, 1998. 1998, Hijack and myself mm -hmm. in Space Space. And there's all, you know, there's these this sort of memories that I have of doing shows with people. So really my, you know, my experience in contact really is about people. And um, I hate to say that it's not about the work, it's kind of, you know, it is about the work, but it's 
also really, really about the people that I have met along the way. I'm gonna cry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of, um, Dustin Haug and Tam and Totsky moved to town how many years ago? I don't know. Oh, I mean. Five or six. Five or six? Seven. Seven, seven or eight, I would say. Seven or eight? No, seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So they moved to town. I started working with them. Um, they were connected to Mark Keogh. And we brought him in for a workshop or two. Um, then that's where I met Blake Nellis and I believe Tasha. Did you take that workshop? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and then in the old bedroom space. Olive came to town, and I remember taking something, improvisation, I don't know what it was, it was contact, but I remember studying with you in the old bedroom space, which is over on Cedar, or was over on Cedar. And, yeah. So I... The old bedlam place behind Potter's like Bar. Yeah, the old guild. The one in Bedlam, that guild stuff. Is that the old guild? Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah, the old guild. Yes. It's not the guild. exact same building as the old guild. No. No, it was behind the guild. It was nearby. I don't know what it was. Probably a child back in the world. But there is a Cedar Avenue or a West Bank Avenue. If you're looking for a geographic number. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. So so there's a very finished right table. There's a lot going on in this building. Yeah. And you're all teaching, Jane? Um, I teach at Carleton College. And um, I teach a And I've been doing that for, I think, about 10 years. And I have, you know, the most amazing experience of working with um, students who have never danced before and need a PE credit. And you know, contact is really cool. So again, this, you know, it's like I get to work with um, and introduce this form to a lot of college students. And some of them, I mean, basically everyone loves it. They're very kind of, you know, at first afraid, of course, of the contact. But by the end of the 10 weeks, um, they're like, no, this class can't end. <laughs> and I tried to institute jams there, but it's really difficult. Um, just because of their schedule. And they're very highly scheduled now, as you probably know, all of the students are. Um, so, yeah, and it really is a contact improvisation class. I try to make it only that. So it's really simple skills of, of weight sharing, and, and, I, and I think that, that that's important to be able to be able to sort of feel what that feels like. And um, we're gonna we've been yes. um Chris Manning has been <laughs> laying the foundation around Patrick and Jane's stories and now we're gonna open it up to we have special guests here to talk about contact improvisation and kind of fill in some of the gaps. We are recording this. If you're not interested in being recorded, there's a little blank spot on the side if you don't want the camera to find you. But otherwise, I wanted to invite you know, Linda, you want to start? Or Rick, do you want to jump in and, and talk a little? Sure. Great. I'm Rick 
Watson. Speak up. And, and I've been doing uh, contact since 1977 when Patrick was at a regional men's conference and I attended and my body went, wow, this is home. Someone else said that. This is, uh, it's playful. It, it has to do with paying attention to yourself, paying attention to others. Just a lot of things that I was curious and interested about. So um, I was living up at my property north of uh, Two Harbors at the time. And uh, I was coming down about once a month. And so I came down a few months later and attended another uh, workshop kind of thing. And Ross Chapin, who used to live here, he was an architect and a longtime contact person from the past. Um, he and Joan Applequist were doing a workshop at this conference. And um, I took it and I got more inspired. And I, and I knew Joan because uh, she had worked at a, she had been at a school I had worked at when she was in high school, a long term school. Um, so I knew her some. And so we were chatting afterwards. She said, Well, how long have you been doing contact? And I said, About two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, she said, Wow, you really get it. You need to come and, and join the Sunday jams. Uh, Sunday jams were happening at the dome at that time, I think. And then later at, at one of Patrick's spaces. So for a long time, whenever I came back in, into the city, I uh, hooked up with the jams. Um, at that same time, Patrick and the people from Minneapolis Contact Works were doing workshops, as Patrick said, and he brought in a lot of people. And I'm going to check my notes to make sure I remember all of them. Um, so I didn't. Steve wasn't here, but um, there was a lot of video that I saw of Steve doing things. So um, I feel like I got to know him some from that, uh, especially. Um, one of his comments in one of the tapes where he said, um, well, it's kind of like, you know, when you play basketball, you get, you know the court, you know your teammates, you know the feel of the ball, you, you know some possibilities, but then in the moment, you don't know what's going to happen. So he was putting it into a, a, a language to describe some of what he was doing in ways that I understood from playing sports when I was a kid. So that, that spoke to me a lot. Um, but the other people that I worked with, Lisa Nelson, Danny Lepkoff, Nancy Stark-Smith, Randy Warshaw, Martin Keo, Tom Trenda, um, who wasn't here, but I met him through the, the Traeger community. And um, he and I had some wonderful dances in the Traeger community at conferences. Uh, Alito, uh, that was already mentioned, uh, and Mandel was here several times. And uh, I especially remember Ernie, and I especially remember him helping me find out some new things about some of the possibilities that I had had before. And I've worked with Nancy about three different times out at uh, Boulder, when she was doing the work at Europa in the summers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was a treat. And I just feel like Nancy inspired me a lot. Partly she inspired me um, because she put things together. Uh, you know, I remember her saying, well, let's warm up with coincidence and intention. <laughs> and my brain at first went, hmm, well, coincidence and intention, those, how, how are you putting those two? Yeah. And of course it was perfect. And I use that all the time. Now when I teach, you know, it's, it's like I'm still using coincidence and intention. Um, the other thing I appreciated about Nancy is I, I really appreciated that she was always open to questions and, uh, and she was always open to uh, working with any and everybody that was there. So that, that's the other part of our kind of there's, there's a lot of quality in that. And just, well, okay, you're new or you're experienced, it doesn't matter. You play and you play at the levels you can. Um, so in terms of my journey, um, in 85, 
85, I became a trigger practitioner. And the principles of trigger and the principles of contact are very similar. The formats are different, but the principles are very close. And so it was just, I learned trigger much easier because I had the background in contact. So it was just a delight to learn trigger because it was so similar to what's um, At the same time, uh, Leva Joy McDonald, who was part of the Contact Jam community and taking classes and stuff down here, she and I got together um, to play some at jams and liked it so much, we thought we should do some more. And so we started teaching together. And 16 years later, <laughs> we finally stopped teaching together. But we, we worked together for a long time. And it was a, it was a delight about the, the thing about relationships where um, the equality again, working together. We would come in to the dance studio that we rented for um, playing to see what we might play with that week in class. And that's how we would decide what we might put out there for that week. Um, and many, many times we'd come in and, and one of us would say, oh, I've been thinking about, and the other person would say, I was thinking about that too. And it was like, you know, whether it was sharing weight, or what, what it was, it was a simple thing or a complex thing, but it was like, we always, we were kind of on the same, Wave. And I, I'd never experienced working with somebody that way before, so it was really amazing. Um, and she and I performed a lot um, at international conferences <laughs> in the Traeger world. Um, did a lot of improv shows, um, you know, some shows where we let the audience throw out some uh, things to us. And um, the one I remember the most was the first time we performed for Traeger community. And, we were doing some terms, you know, like weight or counterbalance or whatever that had to do with contact, and then we just threw them, threw it out to the audience, and somebody said, monkey wrench had nothing to do with anything that I know of. <laughs> but it was the kind of thing that really invites that curious, like, what are you going to do with that? And so that's the other part about contact that's just really fun. You, you get to play with things sometimes that you can't even imagine. Um, I also was part of a, a group that performed from 1984 to at least 2002. I'm not sure how much longer after that we performed, but it was a group called Band Dance at various configurations. But we performed at the May Day Festival every year, 84 to 2002. Um, also did a lot of other performing with other people, but um, in the Man Dance people, in the first performance, Michael Engel, Steve Potts, and Michael Reed and myself, and um, many, many other people in between. Uh, a couple that I wanted to mention just because um, they're close to my heart. Uh, Doug David Crockett, Michael Monaghan, Sean Gashevsky, Bill Lloyd, and Derek Phillips. And Derek and I are still dancing. We just to, to get together and hang out and play with contact. Um, some other folks um, in the community. Um, Jane Bleca was a dancer that I danced and performed with. Uh, Diane Elliott, uh, Carol Horowitz down in Iowa, brought some people down there. So, you know, it was another opportunity to do a workshop with people. Um, Oliva, I mentioned Tim Old, Catherine Larson, uh, Wendy Oliver, Terry Cruzan. Uh, they taught me a lot from the early days in contact with um, Cindy Stevens, <coughs> Judith Howard. Judith and I have performed a number of times together. And, uh, it's always a delight to work with her. Suzanne River. And Sharon Friedler, who taught up at uh, UMD for a, quite a while, she brought me, Jane, and Joan up there to do a performance and a workshop thing up there. So we were at UMD uh, a couple of times. So it's that kind of cross community webbing that Patrick talked about. It's, it's really exciting. So I'm sure I've left out some people. Um, I'm, 
The one thing I did want to share is um, in 2002, I had my first hip replacement. And uh, it was pretty scary, of course, and I didn't know. Am I going to be able to do contact after this? Uh, and I didn't know. But Mandance was still operating, so I came in with my crutches when I was recovering. And I was dancing with people with my crutches, and I was dancing with pe people with my cane when I transferred to the cane. And in that performance in 2002, we did a piece called um, It's not what you can't do, but what can you do? And that's the spirit of contact that I still do. So, so now with two hip replacements, I can still do contact and I can still teach. <laughs> Although I don't do all the things I used to do. Came in 
um, to watch rehearsal. And so they were sitting and watching. You, if you, you saw a little of it uh, on the tape. And the, we had not planned to actually work with people to have them do that, but something happened. I think one of the guys got up or something, or Alito came and got him, and our dancers started doing some of the simpler weight shift, um, counterbalance things with, with the people who were sitting there. And then one guy said, let's, let's do a story, <laughs> not this abstract bullshit. <laughs> Let's do the wizard. So I think Alita said, well, what would you like to do? Let's do the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and, he, and he started assigning parts to various dancers. <laughs> You're Toto. Cat was Toto. You were Toto. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine was the witch. You know, somebody was Dorothy. And, and, and they all got up. All these people got up. And we all started moving. But by, by the end of it, we were all <laughs> moving around and around the room singing. We're off to see the wizard, <laughs> and the the people who were in charge of you know the this daycare center came up to us afterwards. They were astounded. They said they had never seen anything like this. The whole group of them, you know, responding the way they did. And there was one guy. They told us. I don't know if you remember this, Jane. One guy was, he would never talk to anyone. He was always by himself, isolated. No one could touch him. I think I actually worked with him. Mm -hmm. And he got up and participated. It was a miracle! <laughs> the miracle of contact. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've been mentioning Jeff Bartlett. I think, uh, Jeff, you should kind of what are your memories of contact improvisation in the Twin Cities? Um, well, let's see. This is true, right? I'm the, I'm the first and only non-dancer to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, not true. Well, it, it's pretty true. <laughs> that it, so I'm Jeff Bartlett. I, uh, I'm a dance lighting designer, and I ran the Southern Theater as a, primarily as a dance venue for many, many years, more than a quarter of a century. My career at that building began in the uh, story of the 1970s that we've been hearing so much about. Um, when it was opened up by the Guthrie Theater at that time as a second space for the Guthrie called Guthrie II. Guthrie II opened up in 1976 and ran through 79. Guthrie II, when it was first formed, was uh, formed as a second space for the Guthrie, and as such, it had a resident company of equity actors that performed theater plays at 8 o'clock. But at 10.30, the visionary uh, artistic director at the time, whose name was Eugene Lyon, who now lives in Canada, um, had this idea called the 10.30 series. 1030 series was uh, basically a, a stage for community groups to come and use the space. And it was open to a huge range of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, hard to categorize local people, um, dance artists, illusion theater, illusion mind theater uh, performed there before they were illusion. Barbara Berlewitz and Dominique Saran performed there before they were Jean Loon. Um, and Patrick just reminded me that the first time I ran into this group of contact dancers was at the Guthrie too. I worked my way into being the guy who did the lighting for the 1030 series. And after just one short season, the equity company aspect of the, of the Guthrie project uh, tanked. And so, but the Guthrie had a three year lease on the building. And so from being one person among a huge organization, all of a sudden, literally overnight, I became kind of the guy running the space. And um, we started playing host to all these groups from the Twin Cities, including some groups from right down the street, down the street. Uh, and, um, <laughs> down Cedar Avenue, 
where the Guild of Performing Arts was, and also <clears throat> nothing to do with this particular track, but the space that's now the Cedar Cultural Center had been a movie theater that was used by Minnesota Dance Theater mm -hmm. in the back, back in the way early days. So was Mary Cerny involved in that first show that you guys did at the Guthrie II? No, she would have been in England by then. She would have been in England, okay. So somehow or another, through this Guthrie II project, um, played host to, I, I'm pretty sure now, that it was Contact Works before it was yet actually Contact Works. Is, that, is there a chance that we would have Contact Works? Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure about that. Sorry about, sorry about the not being sure part. But now, my personal story is that I moved to Minneapolis after having at a, at a time in my life when I was trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do with my life. And I wasn't really sure. But within a few months of moving to Minneapolis, three things happened. I, I, I walked into the building, which was then the Guthrie II, which then became the Southern. A. B. I discovered dance lighting. And C. I discovered the independent performing arts artists of the Twin Cities. And I fell in love with all three of them, all at the same time, all at once, in 1976. And so that, those forces started to drive my life, really, for the next quarter century, and in many ways still do. It was a very kind of heady time, and it was a time when I, and I think I wasn't the only person who felt this way, who really kind of felt that this course was an outgrowth of the 60s and Woodstock and all that, where we really felt like if we just did really good, important, valuable things in the world, that we would change the world. We could literally change the world with our, with our efforts. Art was, was incredibly important in this somehow. And so, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but for, for, for myself, that period of time was this, was this time when anything could be possible. And if you just you know, found the right combination of people and did the right stuff, you, know, you could just do anything. And it, it really had that kind of quality about it. So I remember these guys came, and I can't remember the details of how it worked out, but they asked me if I would improvise lighting. For their show, and I was all over it. I'm self-taught as a lighting designer. I didn't go to school for lighting design, so I didn't know that, that <laughs> you weren't supposed to do that. I was like, sure, of course, why not? You guys are improvising. I can improvise. I got handles here. I can do that. <laughs> and I remember, uh, I remember, I'm pretty, you know, memories. A funny thing. So maybe this was those guys, and maybe it was a different performance. Not sure which, but whatever it was, there was the, the piece began in the, the dancers took their place in black on, a, on an empty stage and, and formed a big pile of people. And I had a and that was set. And I had a special that was focused on that where, where that group was. And on some either time cue or music cue. I, my job was to, begin, was to fade the lights up ever so slowly, just like, you know, that crossing that fantastic threshold from invisibility into visibility and all the cool things that happen when you write down in that range of what, is you, what are you seeing and everything. And it was really cool. It was, it was a beautiful opening and it was very fun to do. And I remember I did that and then, as I recall, it then migrated out into a performance of improvised lighting and dance. And I just remember after the show, we, as we would do, we hung out in the lobby and the dancers were like, there's that moment and we're in the dark and the light comes up and he's like, yeah, he's, we are like, yeah, he's with us. <laughs> and that for me was like, oh, you know that I'm with Oh, ooh, ooh. like, oh, I, I mean, for me, that was one of the kind of quintessential 
events in my understanding that it was good for me to be a dance line designer. And, then, and that as a dance line designer, I can make a direct, very palpable, if not actual physical body kind of connection with the work. And that became, you know, very, very, and remains very important to my work as a dance line designer. So, mostly, I don't dance. <laughs> mostly, I don't show up on stage. Mostly, I don't like being on stage at all. Mostly, I'm not really very much in my body, even. But, little known fact about <laughs> Jeff Bartlett, I took one and only one dance class. <laughs> Contact and Robert. Uh, Robert. Uh, Robert. Uh, Cityscape, which was this complex that then became Xenon Studios for a while. But before that, it housed Contact Works, it housed the Palace Theater Company, which we could do a whole two hours just on the history of that amazing uh, experimental theater group. And also Mindy, Mindy Ratner had a movie moment. Min Sorry, Mindy yes, Mindy. the other Mindy, not Ratner, that would be that one. Anyway, so there were three independent but sort of related performing spaces in that studio. Um, and so even though I wasn't and am not a dancer, there was something about and there was something about contact that brought welcomed me in as a non-dancer and made me feel like I could do it, and I, and I and I did, and I understood what all those things were that they were talking about in a physical way, the whole way. Oh, that's what you mean by weight, you know, weight bearing, supporting weight, sharing weight, and, and taking risk. And I remember that, um, and, and and I did have wanted to say too that that was one of the things that made contact improv really interesting for me as an audience member when I first saw it was this way in which and I was actually sorry to hesitate <laughs> speaking so weirdly right now but I was relieved, relieved re, I was relieved to see this stuff on video and realize that my memory of it was actually pretty accurate it wasn't some um, spun you know, reconstruction that happened by the passing of years, where there was that, I don't know if you all felt it, but I, for me, there's this sort of refreshing kind of innocent kind of quality about, you know, we're having fun, but you're welcome in to our fun. It's not, it wasn't insular in the sense that we're doing this and you guys can do whatever you want out there. And it, neither was it like, look at us, aren't we great? You know, how cool. It was this really interesting balance between, you know, involving the audience and, and, uh, and doing work that was based on what each other was doing on stage. So I really liked that. And I really enjoyed the opportunity to participate in it in my own sort of halting way. One of my most vivid memories of that class, and one of my most vivid memories ever, <laughs> and I don't know, I mean much of anyone ever made, but I have to tell you. So this studio was on Fifth, was it? Or Fifth Avenue and Fourth Street. Right. Between Third and Fourth. So if you go up Fifth North towards the river, you, right now you pretty much smack into the hole of Crown Mill and Guthrie Complex. At the time, the Guthrie wasn't there, and that whole area was a little bit uh, abandoned. For whatever reason, there was this gigantic uh, pile of sand that went, or something, I think it was sand, that went from essentially like where the Guthrie is all the way down to the river. That whole hillside was covered with sand. And one night after the class, Joanne said, we're going to practice disorientation. And so we went out there for a solid hour. We just rolled down that hill, and then we climbed up, and we rolled down again. And it was 
so it's very hard for me to ever be <laughs> over there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the performance where, where Steve ended up asleep in Jane's house was called 9999. Does that ring a bell? Uh, whether it was that particular show or not, that I was also very involved with, in, with contact during the, the Chris Aiken Chris era. And I think my, my improvised lighting kind of uh, took, a, took a step up. Chris and company would be very interested in setting up a structure like uh, structure of, I remember for one work we, we did a structure of parallel alleyways along the whole stage and then some other, you know, very physical things. When I worked with Chris and Peter in uh, Ohio, we set up a series of triangles and trapezoids. So we would always enjoy setting up a, a set geography, but then of course the way that that geography got used in the work was completely improvised. Um, but I really felt like that was kind of the pinnacle of the, of the uh, you know, my work as, a, as an improvising lighting artist, and I was very happy to be doing so. And, and again, one of my most treasured memories is of Mike Steele mentioning my work and saying that I was somehow adept at this kind of work or something like that. And, that, and, he, and Mike Steele, in his review, talked about how Sometimes I would respond to the dancers, and sometimes I would I would move the dancers with my lighting. So that was fun. It was, it was a really interesting way, and I'm not sure if I would have been able to interact quite in that way if I hadn't actually taken the class and sort of so I could be on stage without being on stage. That's my. You know, and not only did it make us, I think, realize we're not in Kansas anymore in a number of different ways, but also ballet is actually a great language to improvise with because we have this shared vocabulary that we improvise with. And I think the connection of words, realizing how every conversation is an improvisation with words that we all share and know, I think there was a, a change over that happened with our, our, our minds in terms of seeing the, the vocabulary that we had developed with dancers, <coughs> ballet dancers, as words that we could use in that way, and it kind of bridged, at least for me, a mental gap in that way. After that, um, we got connected, because um, we were friends also with, with uh, Chris Aiken and, and Kathy, um, Sally sort of organized this, this thing called Bass Night Out, and it was this five different bass players from the Minnesota Orchestra and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra had this concert, and we were, uh, my company and Chris Aiken, um, were just improvising for about an hour and a half throughout the evening. You we were sort of up and down, in and out, and it was just this sort of happening. And um, uh, Christian Burns, who was in the company at the time, um, who went on to actually be a performing and a life partner of, of Christy Simpson, um, was dancing. And I'll never forget um, watching this performance and seeing Chris, um, first Chris Aiken partnering Sally on point. Um, improvising with her with contact and some ballet, and then Christian Burns taking that to something I've never seen, which is, was an impro improvised classical pas de deux, moving in and out of uh, the classical vocabulary, the contact vocabulary, in a way that really blew my mind. I'd never seen anything. I didn't know that was possible. 
And, and I had been one of those ballet dancers, you know, oh, no, I don't improvise. You know, that was just like, you know, when you're trained in that, that's not what you do. And so it really expanded my understanding of what was, was remotely possible. And, you know, so then was inspired and sort of dove into that community and started, you know, taking classes with a lot of the contact up, upstairs with, with Chris and, and I remember performing with Chris and with you and, and, and many people in, in town. And what I loved about it was I loved being a beginner and again. You know, with with a form, having this, you know, I don't know if you ever master anything, but you know, having a command of the ballet language, all of a sudden having to start over and have this sort of wide-eyed, who should tell beginner, I'm, I'm discovering my body in a new way, kind of it then expanded how I looked at how I did ballet choreography, and I'll be forever thankful for this community in the Twin Cities that that was so embracing and open. There was never a sense of oh, you do this, you do that. We were just there, we were exploring, we were influenced, and, and then, you know, with, within my company, then bringing in people uh, to perform, Chris performed with my company on stage at O'Shaughnessy, as did uh, Christian Burns and Christy Simpson, and, and it, it really was fun, you know, I know it was fun for, for Christy coming in, to saying usually she would go to a community and they would have, you know, one or two performances, and with us we had six performances over two weekends with the same six people able to kind of dive in deeper. And it's something our company then started, the influence, it got to the point where we were having 15 to 20 minute completely open improvisations, open score improvs um, in every performance. And we would pick the music, either be improvised music or we would pick the music an hour or two before the performance. I would maybe tell the dancers what the music was gonna be so they know what was the first song and you know what they would know to be ending on. And when you hear this song, this is the last one, why find your ending? You know, so, and it was really, it, it was cool to be able to do that. And to now, today, the influence is more my structures um, flow in and out of improv and set structures. Um, more, we, we don't as often, though we do sometimes do get completely open scores, but it has found its way inexorably into, um, into that. Now, the last influence, I think, what, one of the things I love about contact improvisation is how almost anything can take it and find a way to use, once your body understands the, these mechanisms of connection, of listening, of, of, of leading, following, it's anything, whether it's sport or dance, I think, you know, can, can find a way to embrace that. And, and something I was exposed to, uh, Argentine tango about four years ago, started doing that and realized its closest cousin is contact improvisation, mm -hmm. the lead and the follow, but it wasn't really, it was only a one-way conversation, which immediately frustrated me. So as soon as I learned something, I want to read, re, you know, change it. Can't help it. Um, so I started uh, teaching Sabina Ibis, who was my contact, who was my tango partner. She would teach me tango. I started teaching her contact improvisation uh, as best I could in order to kind of say, well, you know, we've got this, this improvisational thing. How do we change the lead? How do we pack, pass it back and forth? How do we rotate chair bounce in different ways? So then Sabina has been taking uh, the contact class sometimes with, with you upstairs with, with hijack. And so I think it's another way that this community has brought the improvisation, you know, into the, the tango community. And I've, we've been holding some workshops um, for tango people to kind of be, you know, uh, tying these things in. So it continues to wind its way forward. And that's what I got. Soon after that. So I was doing a full scene on um, Monday Ballet, 
Tuesday Modern, Wednesday Contact, mm -hmm. Thursday Modern, Friday Jazz, with Kathy Young every week. And um, uh, so I believe my first exposure to Contact was um, the tangents in Jane's class. Um, and then I uh, always, always went to Chris's class until he left here, moved to Pennsylvania first, 99, 2000, and he um, passed the Wednesday morning class on to High Jackson, and teaching that for 15 years now. Um, uh, I was a total junkie for New Dance Lab. I'd go to every uh, lunchtime showing. I saw um, just as a total fan, a lot of what's been described today. Um, body logic, or uh, massively influential, seeing so like Southern. Um, in the early 90s, Hijack formed another collaborative called Concrete Farm with Morgan Thorson and Kelly Tennyson and Winona Sorensen from Carlton. And, um, we, uh, in so many ways, were the inventing wheel. It was a very kind of grand union style uh, collective. And uh, we uh, would uh, research together about 20 hours a week, every week for two years, until we did a culminating show called Scout at the Southern of Jeff Flint. Um, we also often brought Jennifer Monson into town. And Jennifer Monson was massively um, in 1997, we uh, carpooled with Cindy Stevens to CI 25, and Olive was there, and Rosie Seamus was there, and um, Chris Aiken and Danielle Beaver were there. Where was that? Megan Flint. It was at Overland. Megan wasn't there. So that was. Um, uh, total kid in the candy store. Um, I first saw Image Lab and Lisa Nelson, and it um, changed my life. Um, so KJ Holmes comes up here. She taught a class at Center for Performing Arts. Almost everybody we were um, encountering out in the world eventually came to Minneapolis for a class. So we were getting Jennifer Monson. After we met, um, after Hijack met Karen and Nelson um, at CI25, we started bringing here for workshops. And we got to do um, three or four so far, and there's another one that Body Cartography is going to be in November. Through her, I met Margaret Gallanter of Seattle slash Oakland, um, and she has come in often to teach. Um, and there's been a lot of um, flow to travel out of Minneapolis um, to study that I feel is really influential because I've met, uh, I, I really got to know Otto Ramstad, his name's right there, um, uh, at the Brightbush Jam. And I went to Brightbush because Jane said it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Jane Shopping brought Jess Curtis to town, and it was amazing, and I got to pick him up at the airport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I was uh, uh, hung out around the Improv Summit as much as I was allowed, and it was at the old Patrick's Cabaret. So it was a tiny space, and there really wasn't room for extra hangers. So we had to figure out how to be polite um, and participate um, when possible. Um, in 2010, um, Otto and I went to Earth Dance to study material for the spine and the past. And um, as I say, we performed a, a duet right when we got back at Ball's Cabaret in the Southern. And I should go back and say when I got back, when I got back from CI 25, 
we performed duets at Balls Cabaret every single Saturday for three months, mm -hmm. and it was pure contact improvisation called Don't Get Me Wrong, I Worship at the Shrine. <laughs> 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 um, the trio we performed with Jane Shockley at um, Hijack's Tax Return at Space Space was called I Am Not Responsible for My Actions. <laughs> Um, and then 2011 through 13, I think, Steve Paxton and Lisa Nelson taught an ongoing uh, three-part intensive at Earth Dance um, that I also did along with Jennifer Arby and Sarah Bomber, another local dancer. So there's been a lot of um, concrete partners in Amsterdam studying with Julian Hamilton. Um, so, uh, a lot of examples being set by Jane Shockley and Chris Aiken, and any name they would draw, or someone, you know, Peter Bingham would come here, or Andrew Harwood, and then we would all go run and get another week long workshop out of town and come back. I think 
Megan Flood, they might be Janelle Diva participated at some point. And then we moved here in 2001. And that's, and I just had a Colin Rush, and I also worked with Colin Rush a lot. And we did a series on Sean Smith of Space. Performance. Performance series. And we also had a improvisation practice series. Musicians or a different focus every week, so it wasn't primarily contact, but contact, of course, was like the shared language for everybody. Yeah. And we did that for the Calhoun building. The Calhoun building. The Calhoun building, right, in, in, in the upstairs, in Chris Watson space, and then mm -hmm. at the Armenian church. So, yeah. somewhere upstairs here. Um, so I first studied contact in the, in the 90s, and no, the, yes, in the late 80s, early 90s in London, and I'm going to figure out the name, Gabby, whose last name I can't remember right now, who's my husband's favorite. But then also I studied with Karen and KJ as part of my education in the Netherlands, and with Lisa and Steve, and so those were sort of grounding forces for me in, in, in forming my work, and I think I came out of school, I ended up going into the danceability training, going to CI 25, um, and really wanting to kind of uh, bridge this space between these beautiful studios and the rest of the world, and in a way that's how body cartography started, was really in this appetite or desire to bring these practices out into public spaces. Um, and then we lived in San Francisco, I lived in San Francisco for five years and I was very immersed in 848 so, and taught a lot with the jam at 848 and so that was the whole Keith Hennessy, uh, Jess Curtis, uh, all of Stephanie Maha, everyone you know in San Francisco, in Santa Cruz, Rosie was living in Santa Cruz at that time, Rosie Smith, um, many, many, many names and I was also an organizer of the West Coast Contact Festival. And then we moved here in 2001 and um, uh, have, I feel like, mostly been teaching contact improvisation within what we do as dance makers and as improvisers and as body mind syndrome teachers versus teaching extensively or exclusively contact improvisation classes, although we did teach for the 30th anniversary and have taught for you several times um, over the years and uh, yeah and so here we are <laughs> back at this series now which Wendy Rubel who I was hoping would be here kind of initiated in a way so now there's this you know energy happening again around the form which you should come to class and Karen Nelson is coming to town on the 22nd and 23rd of November which is the same weekend that Steve and Lisa are performing at the Walker so if you're interested in knowing more, you can talk to me or um, go to the body that's on the I don't know if I have more to say. Um, we are, it's, it's past four, but I, you know, I wanted to spend some time hearing from the audience. So if, you're, if you want to stay and um, keep telling stories, we can kind of map and part of um, your stories and time. Of the summer, last summer, when I said, you know, I'm going to start working at the coal center, she said, you've got to do something about that big white wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew immediately which wall she was talking about. And I thought about how this building has so much history in it, but the influences through the different people and communities that have passed through the doors is not apparent anymore. So the mapping is about seeing the people and the influences that we've had on each other in this community and whether influencing potentially a mural. So that's kind of the seeds of what this mapping is about, to see our connections together, but to also to see how it's affected a community and to the point of building a building or con connecting two buildings to 
to one another. Um, and uh, it's funny, I, I highlighted this from the newsletter that was the um, New Dance Lab. After the Danceability Project, there was an essay and it starts, is this dance, is it therapy, is it education, is it art, why am I doing this? And I feel like we've been kind of circling around these, these themes through today's talk. Um, and I think it's really important that this is being hosted at the Cole Center for Dance and the Performing Arts. And I'll give a quick plug to the others in this lecture series. You've heard about the other contact dance um, events happening around town leading up to Steve Paxton's performance and lecture at the Walker. In January, we're doing the same format, different people about spaces. And I've already been collecting names. You know, the Guild of Performing Arts has come up, Ozone Studio. I did not know about David's studio above French, New French. David Critchlitz. Yeah, so I'll get this going. Um, but Guthrie 2, uh, the 1030 series in Cityscape, there's, there's some great um, spaces that have made up the history in the community. So um, in January, we're doing a lecture on legendary spaces. In March, educational outcomes, so dance that's been put in the schools. And developing dances in May, and that's about works of progress series. Um, also, writing about dance, and I think Mike Steele's name's come up a few times, and I think that's an important kind of uh, local influence on putting language to dance. So this, are, it's, this is a resource, and um, it's exciting to see how all of this is starting to play out, and it's just the first step. But I wanted to open it up. I don't know if, if you need to leave, then absolutely, but if others want to stick around and tell their stories, you're welcome. I just want to say, this is so beautiful. It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> what about projections of these over time on this wall? Yeah. Nice. I, I forgot to mention, I brought the copies of some reviews of dance that Chris and I did together, um, and then Unsafe Unsuited with Keith and Ishmael that I have copies of here. Um, and on the back side of the Keith and Ishmael review, I have the YouTube links to the things that I showed today or talked about, mm -hmm. so that you can take that with you if you'd like. I'll leave it on the front desk over here. Judith? I wanted to thank everybody who participated, and I wish we had time to introduce everybody to each other, but um, I've been a long time observer of what goes on, and writer, and participant choreographically, and I wanted to bring up a person who um, I wish you could all take the time to answer her connection, but um, I was a student in New York when Anna Helfrin was quite in, and by 1967, her knowledge of tasks supporting dancers by falling onto each other, doing all kinds of assignments that she would um, propose about how to um, support each other and how to do all the things that you've been mentioning became foremost in her mind. And a dancer who studied with her was Marilyn Wood, who made dance scores in public spaces. And uh, she revived, for example, Central Park by her um, single-handed use of changing it at New Year's Eve and making it safe for the public to dance together there. And I brought Marilyn Wood to Walker Arts Center in 1970, where she did dance scores and all kinds of events basically coming out of Anna Helpern's work. And of course, Anna Helpern's husband um, created the Nicollet um, Mall, and which has been quite changed. We won't say ruined since. What's his, what's his name? Lawrence Helpern. Uh, Lawrence Helpern. And Lawrence and Anna did all kinds of important things together. And at the dance sport conference that Patrick brought up, um, Anna and Steve got the two major awards, and they did improvise together, and so it's another name out there. 